Hey folks, this is uh, an ERISA legal update on litigation. And again, this was adapted from a presentation I gave to the Madison Benefits Council, but I am putting it online to try and uh, get it to a wider audience in case anyone might find it helpful. So uh, this is uh, these are the main takeaways. This is what we're gonna cover in this part, which again is litigation focused. I'm gonna do an update on University 403B litigation. And there've been some settlements and decisions there. We're gonna talk about uh, participant data and that includes marketing and privacy concerns. And then a uh, little bit about uh, lifetime income, Secure Act and those new provisions and how they might affect litigation. The pension mortality litigation, uh, we'll, we'll talk about ERISA waivers for and releases, uh, loss evaluation and, and index funds under the Putnam decision. Uh, we'll talk about the standing to sue pensions in the Supreme Court there. A little bit on proprietary funds, which has been going on for a while. Uh, the stock drop insider trading case uh, on which the Supreme Court recently punted. Uh, the very recent uh, Intel v. Sulema decision on uh, statute of limitations and actual knowledge of notice. A uh, little bit on non-ERISA plans and how they're being uh, attacked. And then a few health and welfare issues like anti-assignment provisions and the practice of cross-plan offsetting. And then the wellness program that has been sued. And these are the other issues covered. You might have seen these videos, but I talked about legislation and regulation updates as well. So help yourself to those if, if those might apply to you. Now, so we're going to focus on litigation. It's going to cover a lot, but let's start with an update on the 403B university litigation. Now, these are, we, I, we call it 403B, but I think one or more of them might be 401Ks, but for our purposes, it's just a lot of big name, large private universities uh, that were sued and, and mostly 403B plans. And generally it's over 10,000 plan participants, over a billion in plan assets each. Uh, many of them had multiple vendors, sometimes hundreds of plan investment options. And as you can see from that list, some pretty big name universities, including my undergrad, my law school and uh, a couple other places where I either know people or my uh, family members went there. Just a, a, a lot of big name universities. Uh, the claim, it's a fiduciary breach claim. It's based on the fees that they're unreasonable, they weren't disclosed, the investments are underperforming, plan design issues, all, all sorts. Uh, it sort of parallels very similar 401k litigation against for-profit employers. Uh, going back to 2006, and employers like Lockheed Martin, Caterpillar, General Dynamics, etc., cetera, uh, were, were all sued. And that litigation and this one were both spearheaded by Schlichter, uh, a St. Louis law firm that specializes in, uh, among other things, suing ERISA plans on behalf of participants. So, and it's been very important, especially the, the 2006, the 401k litigation has been very important in changing this space and changing the practices of, of ERISA plans, especially qualified retirement plans. So some of the claims that we've seen against these uh, University 403Bs were that they had so many investment options that that itself was a fiduciary failure. They, they couldn't monitor that many. They weren't leveraging size to get share classes. So if you fracture assets, that's just going to be bad for share class reasons. Uh, and also that they're just duplicative investment options in the same asset class. So you, you can't say that all of them are the best option in each asset class. If, if you've got people in, you've got multiple of them, they can't all be the best. And so it's just, it's very, very uh, difficult to monitor is basically, basically a big, big part of that because you just, you shouldn't have so many, you shouldn't have so many hundreds of options. You should really focus. And that's, that's really best practice as I think we've seen, if, if you're working on this space, you can see that generally your DC plans, your 401ks, they're they're going to have not a, a large menu of options um, outside of, say, a, a self-direct brokerage window. Uh, so that's probably best practice at this point. Um, and then they also claimed that the fees were, were excessive, were unreasonable, the revenue sharing, which obviously has been under attack for a while, um, having multiple vendors could, could be imprudent, could cause uh, excessively high fees and you're, you're fracturing again. So you're losing asset leverage and we're not doing regular RFPs. Uh, 
you know, so it's it's and then they also attack the how the fees were calculated per participant instead of by plan asset. So uh, just just a lot of different claims all over the board, really trying to attack all of these plans all over. And they also attack just the existence of insurance wrapped funds and the, the use of active funds over over passives, which is probably a more a little more controversial claim. Um, it's really a, a good good spread of many different claims, different allegations. So the outcome is uh, six of them are still in district court litigation. Class has been certified for four of them and uh, no dismissal for a couple. Uh, have gotten district court dismissals for five. Um, all of those are pending either at the circuit or uh, in the case of UPenn for um, the Supreme Court. And then there have been settlements for six and that is the chart on the right from Bloomberg Law. Uh, detailing all of the different settlements that have been paid out of this group. And NYU is actually the only one. They they won a victory. They they went to trial in 2018 and, and won on all counts. And there were a couple others, Rochester and Long Island University, those, those were withdrawn, uh, and they don't quite fit the mold for the, all of these other universities. And you can see on the right the spread of, of how much these university plans have paid, uh, up to $18 million from MIT and $3.5 million uh, from Brown at the at the other end. So something else that's uh, come out of the 403B litigation is the issue of participant data. So I'm going to take it and run with it because this seems like a, a real trend that we're looking at and something that, that everyone needs to start considering. Uh, number one, is participant data an ERISA plan asset? That's an important question uh, for a lot of reasons. There could be fiduciary duties. Uh, it could affect whether ERISA vendors can cross-sell. So on the right, uh, I've, I've captioned a couple different perspectives here. So you've got Jerry Schlichter, who again, Schlichter Law Firm spearheaded the University 403B litigation starting in 2016 and the uh, for-profit 401k litigation back in back to 2006. Uh, and so his perspective is probably important to the way the plaintiff's bar is looking at it. And he makes a pretty aggressive claim that data, meaning plan data, retirement plan data, should not be used to sell other products any more than a doctor should use confidential patient information to sell products to patients. Now that sounds relatively aspirational because there, he, the HIPAA would apply to the latter, but there, there isn't quite a, there's no HIPAA exact analog here. So he, he might be, uh, well, yes, he's reaching, he's reaching a little bit, but that might be where things are headed. So we could be headed in a direction where he is more right than wrong. And it's possible that a lot of participants would think that he is more right than wrong and that they don't necessarily want their data to be used. So that's that's also a perspective to consider uh, when we're talking about plan design questions. Conversely, we've got the DOL, which does not get involved here. And that's the, the middle box on the right, the DOL advisory opinion that just says it'll point to state law on the question of property. And state law generally does not treat that sort of information as, as property, even with a strong protection statute. That's just not how it rolls. Uh, and then at the bottom is the Castle v. Vanderbilt settlement, which is why we are dealing uh, with this as an outgrowth of the 403B litigation. So we'll talk about that in a second. Uh, so, so is participant data a plan asset? Well, the DOL doesn't, doesn't say yes or no. Uh, the ERISA regs don't say yes or no. They, they just say, look at state law. And for the most part, state law does not say that, that it's a property or an asset. So that seems like it's more against the plaintiff's bar than, than for it. Uh, Northwestern litigation, the 403B litigation, did consider this. And the court said, no, data is not an ERISA plan asset. Uh, it's a privacy right. It's not a property right. Then we get a different result in the settlement of the Vanderbilt litigation. So Vanderbilt uh, settled. And what they said in that settlement was they agreed that uh, the vendor uh, must be restricted, meaning the record keeper, from using participant data to cross sell services to the participants uh, if it's unrelated to the plan, unless the participant initiates. And that's in there a couple times in, in the settlement data. So obviously that's not a court decision. That's not the DOL's opinion. That's not state law. That is just binding on Vanderbilt, but it does tell you where things are sort of pointing. So it's something to consider. And here's an issue. Is the participant data valuable? And I, I would say that's clearly got to be yes, at least in many circumstances. Information 
can be like property, it can be valuable, and the example I've used is uh, sales leads. So if you've seen the movie Glen Gary, Glen Ross, the the entire uh, central, you know, motivating element of the movie, the MacGuffin, is these sales leads, these valuable sales leads, and you can you can sell uh, real estate or, or whatever it is they're trying to sell uh, to to people with these leads because they're so powerful. You've got so much information that you can you really know who to sell. And that's where you get the line, always be closing. That was very famously deployed in that movie. The idea is obviously, I mean, those sales leads are valuable. They were stolen in the end of the movie. Sorry, spoiler alert. Uh, but they're very valuable. So that doesn't necessarily mean they're property, especially in the hands of an ERISA plan. But they do have value. And that is also part of this discussion. So most privacy laws are about privacy protection, not property. It's true for HIPAA, CCPA, GDPR. Uh, but the ability to monetize information is a valuable part of the vendor's contract. And I think one way to confirm this is if your vendor is currently cross-selling or monetizing data in any way, to ask them to stop and ask them if they would need to renegotiate their fees or any other part of the contract costs uh, or compensation if, if cross-selling was taken out. And if, if they want to renegotiate, if they want to charge more, then that's that's implicitly acknowledging, if not explicitly, that the ability to monetize, the ability to cross-sell uh, participant plan, plan participant data uh, does have value. That does not mean it's property, but it does have value. So uh, there there is a question of whether it needs to be disclosed, and I don't think that there's any clear guidance on this. So I'm, I just sort of raised the issue. You can see some of my notes where I, I really dig into it. I don't want to push too hard because we don't really have guidance here. So I don't want to go too far afield, but it is an interesting question. Um, I think that it's pretty clear that a lot of planned data about participants would have value to a vendor if it chose to monetize it or cross-sell or, or otherwise uh, use it in that way. So there's just a question. Should that data use be disclosed as comp compensation? Uh, it, you know, Disclosing compensation is part of what makes an ERISA vendor contract, a reasonable arrangement. So you do have to disclose compensation. Is that access compensation? Maybe, maybe. I mean, it's it's not clear the DOL said yes, uh, or just, sorry, they clearly haven't said yes, but they have not said no at this point. At least that's my understanding. So I'm just raising this as an issue. I, I don't think that there's a clear answer. And what you think the answer is will probably change by whether you are a plan or an employer, or you advise plans or employers, or whether you're a vendor, an administrator, and you uh, are trying to sell these services. So I will just say, I have only ever advised employers and plans. So my perspective is on protecting them from risk. And I have not uh, had to advise vendors on what is appropriate, and what is risky. So I probably have a more conservative notion here that, well, even if even if we don't know, let's just be safe. And if you're you're more vendor side than employer side, you you might have a different perspective that, uh, well, with with adequate protections, having this data it doesn't need to be disclosed, or or we can generically disclose it. So I I'm not going to say that there's a, a right or wrong answer. I think that this is still in flux. So my takeaway for plans is that you should probably assume that there is a fiduciary duty to examine vendor data practices. Um, and that means with regard to data security, our vendor's gonna keep the data secure and they're gonna have various safeguards. Are they gonna do breach notification, et cetera? What's, what's the timeline for that notification? And then with regard to privacy of the data, are they monetizing it? Do they sell it on? Do they share it with any affiliates, but not, not for cash? Uh, I would just say, put that in your RFP when you're doing one, um, ask about, you know, transmission to affiliates, ask about any sort of commissions or, or revenue sharing or, or anything similar, any, any, anything that might mean that the information is, is getting passed on and just ask them to at least disclose it. So at least you know what's going on. Uh, and then you can even raise the possibility that the data use needs to be explicitly negotiated, put in the agreement possibly disclosed as compensation and fees. Um, if you're a vendor, I would suggest that you should just anticipate greater scrutiny on, on data security and on cross-selling and privacy. And I think that that's an opportunity to present security and privacy efforts as, as a real selling point. And I've already seen a lot of vendors doing this. And I think leaning into that is probably a good strategy if, if you can credibly do so. I would suggest that that's, that's effective 
from an employer side perspective that that is something that that is valuable to hear uh, and to signal that that you are your understanding of data security and data privacy and, and you're, you're doing that. I think you should also look at your privacy, your pricing internally and decide like, how valuable is this? Do we, do we even need it? If it's not very valuable, can we just offer that we won't monetize? And, you know, this is something that you're going to have to consider uh, on your end. And I, I think you should be sort of forward looking and decide what this means to you, how valuable it is, and then uh, determine the risks and maybe be ready to ask if you, if you get a plan with an annoying uh, advisor like me, you know, what, what would you say to me to stop me from annoying you? How, how could you comfort me that, that this is fine? And, you know, I think there are a lot of answers and I've sort of previewed them a little bit, but there, there are a lot of good answers. But I think just be ready with those answers to, to swap me down if I start to get annoying. Uh, moving on to, uh, we've got these new lifetime income provisions. And if you watch the ERISA legal update on uh, legislation, you'll see it, but you your DC plans have got to include a lifetime income estimate, and that's not effective yet. We're still waiting for the DOL to finalize uh, the rules on that. But when it happens, the idea is, will we start getting more DC plans with lifetime income options? And uh, Jerry Schlichter, again, of the Schlichter law firm that's that's done a lot of the litigation we've discussed, has already talked about this one as well and suggested that uh, the plans need to watch their watch their step, be careful, and they're really going to focus on pricing and benefits. And I think that's probably because there's often been a criticism that uh, variable annuities might might be mispriced or, or overpriced and that it's a, it's a little difficult to uh, get some pricing discipline relative to some other products in the same space, some, some alternatives. Uh, that life insurance uh, products like annuities can can sometimes be expensive. So if you are going to move to a, a model that includes lifetime income options, obviously be aware of the Secure Act, which has a, a safe harbor for selecting the fiduciary. It's about it's about, it's about the fiduciary standard that you would probably expect. Um, I would be very careful about the independence of your provider, whether it's affiliated with with the plan sponsor, with any of the vendors, uh, you know, I definitely pursue an independent uh, objective process. It doesn't mean it has to be independent, but you should consider uh, it should be competitive with independent, non-proprietary uh, lifetime income options. And I really, it's just safest not to do it at all, to be honest, to not to introduce the extra risk. But if you're going to do it, make sure you're looking fairly, very heavily at the prices and the services, features, and benefits, and just, just consider that and try to really, really be uh, aggressive, look aggressively at, at those prices. I think that's really where this is going to focus. So a lot of the rest of these cases, I'm going to try to move pretty quickly. They are incredibly uh, interesting and complex, and they have a lot of depth, but if they apply to you, that's I probably still couldn't do them justice. And if they don't apply to you, then you maybe don't really care. So I'm going to try to move quickly, although they are really interesting. Uh, we've got litigation against pension plans for using mistaken or obsolete mortality assumptions in, in their tables. Uh, and we've got some really bad facts here, like plan sponsors using much more updated mortality assumptions for financial purposes, but using much older assumptions for plan purposes. So the takeaway here is lots of big plans are being sued, especially over 10,000 participants, over a billion in assets. That's you know similar to the University 403B. If you if you hit those thresholds, that really can, and you've got a name brand university, a name brand company that people have heard of, uh, uh, that can really make all of that can make you a target. Uh, but the takeaway here is check check the mortality assumptions in your pension plan. And that should include any any kind of lifetime income option, uh, and especially compare them to any internal assumptions or financial assumptions that you're using, because that is just a bad fact. That just sounds bad. If you're saying, well, for these purposes, it matters, so we'll do it. We'll do updated assumptions for financial projections, but we're going to use outdated assumptions. That's, that's a bad fact. It's not per se imprudent, but that that is a bad fact. You don't want to have to defend that. Um, and then if you've got a good reason to do it, Embrace it, document it, figure it out, figure out why it's actually better that you're, you're doing the right thing, run towards it. But, you know, if you don't have a pension plan, that doesn't even apply to you. So moving on, uh, 401k individual arbitration was upheld, and this is just the Ninth Circuit, Dorman case. 
uh, the takeaway here is consider adding a class and collection act collective action waiver uh, to your ERISA plan. And if you're going to do that, uh, you can have, uh, if the class waiver is unaffordable, unenforceable, you might want to bail out um, so that you can go to court because collective arbitration is often considered not, not a great uh, idea. And this is interesting because the Ninth Circuit had previously said the opposite. But because of Supreme Court precedent, that's um, Epic Systems versus Lewis from 2018, that held that federal statutory claims are generally arbitral. And ERISA claims are federal statutory claims. So there you go. Uh, and then if you've got a waiver, a release, where that employees are signing, you can get a waiver of ERISA fiduciary claims. I've got a couple cases there where that did work. Uh, but the important thing to remember is uh, ERISA 502A1B versus 502A2 and 502A3, right? So vested benefits, that's a contractual right, but A2 and A3 uh, under ERISA are, are statutory rights. So you can get a release that waives those ERISA statutory rights. So go ahead and review your releases if you are an employer or if you are uh, a vendor who's who's got anybody doing doing releases. Uh, go ahead and make sure that they either cover ERISA or all federal statutes, or you could say both. And just remember that you, you won't be able to reach vested benefits. Uh, and that loss evaluation, I sometimes shorthand this as why all of your 401k funds, fund options should be index funds. And not everyone likes when I say it that way. I'm, I'm being a little provocative, more than a little provocative when I say that. Uh, but uh, Putnam, so it was just a first circuit, it was not Supreme Court, but it was about proprietary funds, which were proprietary to, I believe, the employer and the failure to monitor. But the, the interesting issue here that people have been, uh, commentators have been uh, noting and observers have been observing, is that uh, if there's a fiduciary breach and there's a plan loss, you can, of course, presume that the breach caused the loss, but more than that, you can sh say that the loss compared to a low cost index fund uh, is the loss. That's how you can calculate or evaluate the loss. So really what this means, my interpretation of this, and again, I'm, I'm always employer side, so that's, I always have a more conservative take, but my more conservative risk averse take for employers is you should assume every single fund in your 401k or other, other, you know, a risk qualified plan, uh, needs to be better than an index fund with regard to fees and performance. And if you can't say it's better than an index fund, that's a risk. Now that is not officially, no courts don't actually say that, but that's that's the implication here. That would be the conservative take. And uh, that, you know, really fiduciaries need to consider, is this active fund better than a low cost index fund? And if it is great, that's fine. But if it's doing worse, get get rid of it. Get rid of it. Find an index fund that that is more appropriate. Uh, that's really how I read Putnam. That's a relatively conservative interpretation. Putnam does not say everybody has to get out of active funds. But it does say if there's a fiduciary breach, that you can use an index fund to show loss. If your if your active fund is underperforming its index benchmark, that is a loss. And if you've got a fiduciary breach, uh, you could be liable. So. Uh, an interesting one there. I don't want to overstate it, but my conservative take is uh, sort of how I how I like to present it to people. Uh, we're expecting the Supreme Court to weigh in on another issue on uh, whether you can sue a DB plan, a pension that's fully funded. We're expecting that sometime later in 2020. It hasn't happened yet, but it is an interesting question of whether you can you can sue the plan. I mean, you're not you're not going to get anything out of it, and the the fund is already, uh, the plan is already fully funded. So interesting question. I, I'm, I'm not actually sure where uh, most people expect that to fall. Um, but if you've got a fully funded or nearly fully funded DB, that's that's something that, that you might want to pay attention to. We've got ongoing litigation about proprietary funds. So Putnam was one of these. This has been going on for quite a while. And there, there are some recent ones that I call out, Goldman Sachs and Prudential. Often it's the uh, employer is the proprietary fund, but it could be potentially also a vendor has uh, 
a vendor to the plan and the funds are proprietary to the vendor could theoretically uh, the, the same arguments could apply uh now it's not per se imprudent it's just it is a litigation risk because just the underlying economics it can kind of look a little bit like self-dealing it's sort of easy to make those allegations is, is how i would put it so it it can just look bad even if it's perfectly uh acceptable and prudent and great for the participants it, it can look bad so it's just it's not a great fact even though uh it is permissible uh in most cases uh so it's just safest to avoid unless it's clearly just better if it's clearly better that gives you a pretty strong argument for why you're you're going for it but you you definitely want to compare to any options from the same provider outside the plan because that's a really bad fact that came up in a lot of these cases if it's better outside the plan that looks really awful that looks like you're bilking participants so that that could be that's been used against a lot of plans and then we're expecting more from the supreme court uh, in the future on this one, I don't know if it's Jander or Yonder. I, I always hear it as Yonder in my head. Uh, but this is a, a post Dudenhofer. This is for stock drop. And uh, the question was, as with most of, the, most of these stock drops, like what, how do you, as an ESOP fiduciary, what, what are you supposed to do? How do you sell? How do you share information when that could affect the asset? And there's an interesting insider trading twist, and the Supreme Court basically said, well, the SEC and the DOL didn't talk about insider trading, but that's really relevant, so get the SEC to weigh in. Um, and, you know, it is it is interesting, like, would it be insider trading to talk about that information, and the SEC didn't weigh in. So maybe we'll hear more on that in the future. Uh, and then Intel v. Salima. So this just came out. Uh, very recently from the Supreme Court, and the question is about how you show actual knowledge. How do you prove someone saw a disclosure, which is relevant for the statute of limitations and getting that to run, um, the three-year versus the six-year statute? And I think a lot of us were pretty surprised that the Supreme Court had a relatively high standard, a strict view of how to show actual knowledge. You had to prove that someone had actually looked at a disclosure. Uh, that does seem like a high bar because it does mean it's relatively easy for someone to say well i never saw that which is what the the uh, plaintiff here said that yes i logged onto the website during the time the disclosure was there but i never noticed the, the disclosure so i didn't have actual notice and the supreme court agreed but it doesn't seem at this time like uh it's, it's not clear that it will really help a lot of class actions because you'd have to go through every single participant and do you know, an investigation, a hearing, in order to figure out if they had or hadn't looked at it. At least some people are concerned that that might be the case. So it's not clear how much this is going to matter. Um, it's also possible that a lot of plans or vendors could just introduce some kind of a, a, a click box or some kind of other active acknowledgement that a participant saw a disclosure. That's one possibility people have suggested. So sort of an interesting one. We're still figuring out where that lies. And then this is a trend. It's not super new but it's still sort of slow motion going on there are some uh, plaintiffs firms that have been targeting non-ERISA plans which is primarily government but also church uh, to say that all of their plans are actually ERISA plans and to you know rack up uh, penalties and, and damages that way the argument is usually that these are quasi-governmental which would mean that uh you know, they're not actually maintained by a government entity directly. They're not controlled by, you know, state or local officials. And the employees aren't treated as government employees. So why is this a government plan is essentially the argument, uh, especially if, you know, no state or local government has responsibility for the liability. So um, sort of an interesting argument. Uh, really, we're waiting for the IRS here because uh, the code and ERISA mostly align on on governmental definition. And I think generally the accepted tax result is that these are governmental so uh, we'll, we'll see what the irs does here i think i don't know that we're expecting it imminently but generally speaking if the irs could weigh in that, that could clarify what, what's going on here uh, and then health and welfare anti-assignment clauses are being held as enforceable but make sure that uh, the plan language is clear and you know avoid doing anything that might implicitly waive the anti-assignment clause 
and uh, you know watch out as a backstop your review your authorized representative provisions because uh, a lot of out of network network health providers use that um, as, as a backup and and you have less flexibility there for cross plan offsetting I, th I think if you're in this space you already know that this is not great but it's still going on a little bit uh, we're still sort of shaking it out the DOL has been pretty clear that they don't like it they believe it violates ERISA basically because the TPA is on both sides of a transaction and all cross plan offsetting is if you're if you're not in this space is that the TPA of the health plan the third party administrator of the health plan uh, might deal with the same hospital or health provider for multiple unrelated plans from different employers and will offset uh, liabilities and costs uh, from one plan to another just to net out the payments and simplify paying the uh, the provider and that can just be easier for for their administration well the the dol says don't do that um so i think the takeaway is if you're a health plan uh, that your your plan document should clearly prohibit this uh, just to avoid the risk i think your vendor agreements should pretty clearly uh you know make sure that they explicitly prohibit it again to avoid the risk and maybe consider other other language uh, about how to uh, manage this sort of risk and i think if you're a vendor i, I think obviously the the dol has been pretty clear that they don't like this and then uh, the yale wellness program was also sued this is this connects back to the wellness regs from the EEOC, and which was pursuant to litigation, those regs were struck down. So now we've sort of lost the safe harbor. So we don't exactly know where, we, where we've fallen. And it was the AARP that sued the EEOC. Uh, sorry, sorry for all those acronyms, but the, uh, the AARP sued and they got those regs struck down. And as a result, we don't have the safe harbor. Now AARP has sued Yale over their wellness incentive, which was one of the more, uh, one of the biggest uh, wellness incentives, uh, relatively uh, extreme value. And I think that's part of the reason that they, they've targeted it. And uh, for a while we had been saying, well, the EEOC probably isn't gonna enforce this, but that, and that's true, the EEOC is still writing the regs and they've been writing them for several years now, so who knows uh, what we're gonna get. But the, there is this litigation risk and, and obviously Yale has stepped into it. So that's relatively new, not much has happened yet, but we'll, we'll see what happens. All right, so that was a lot and I left so much on the table. All of those were so dense, I could have gone into a lot more detail. But uh, if any of those applied to you, hopefully now you know they exist and you can you can really try to dig into them and, and figure out what you're going to do as a result. But I, I hope that this has been helpful. Let's go through the takeaways just in case uh, you weren't paying attention for the last half hour. This is uh, where I just very briefly summarize them all again. But if you if you uh, if these apply to you, then hopefully you heard and you can you can uh, go back and dig in for more details. And other than litigation, I, I also have ERISA legal updates covering legislation and regulations. So go ahead and check those out if any of these issues apply to you. All right, folks. Well, thank you again for all your patience, and I wish you well.